Integration techniques can be a little thankless um, in the sense that technology is rendering doing this stuff by hand sort of increasingly, um, it's making it an increasingly fringe skill, it seems to me. So I'll try not to dwell on this, but you do need, especially if you're going into calculus too, you do need some background in integration. If you're going to do anything with differential equations, we're going to need some background with integration. So I'm going to keep this as light as I think it's appropriate to keep it, but this is material we need to cover. Having said that, it's not immediately going to look like the material I put on the board has anything to do with that monologue I just gave. Because we're going to talk about the inverse trig functions. And it's going to turn out that the inverse trig functions, really the arc tangent most of all, um, can be used to take some important integrals. So, that's, that's the connection to what I was talking about earlier. Um, let's remind ourselves of these. Um, functions, let's, are in Versus if their compositions undo each other. If f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x then g and f then g and f are inverses um so a classic and easy or relatively easy example f of x equals x cubed and g of x equals the cubed root of x. These functions are inverses. If you take the cubed root of x and cube it, you get x. And if you take the cubed root of x cubed, you get x. And that stuff I have on the left of the, those equal signs are the compositions. This is what? This is f of g of x. This is g of f of x. So these functions are inverses, and in practical terms, the in practical terms, the point of inverses is to let you solve equations. So if you want to solve the equation x cubed equals seven you can take the cubed root 
of both sides. On the left, the cube and the cube root turn into x. So there's your solution. x equals the cubed root of 7. We'd like to be able to do the same thing as this with trig functions. Like if we have the sine of x equals 0 0.7, we'd like to be able to hit both sides of this equality with the inverse of the sine and solve for x. But there's a complication, which is that none of the trig functions have inverses. Not every function has an inverse. Um, and the reason that not every function has an inverse is that, okay, let's say we have a function, and it takes two inputs, and it sends them to the same output. That's a perfectly valid thing that a function is allowed to do. The inverse undoes the function, though. So if the inverse exists, it would then have to map this input here and this input here in order to undo both of those mappings. And the one thing no function is allowed to do is take one input and send it to multiple outputs. So, we cannot have a function that takes this input and sends it to multiple outputs. So, the, um, the sign, for example, is a perfect example of this. The sign of zero is zero. The sine of 2 pi is also 0. So the sine has no inverse. And you can do this with all six of the trig functions. Graphically, a function has no inverse if you can draw a horizontal line that touches the graph more than once. And certainly, if you look at the graph of the sine, it's very easy to draw a horizontal line that touches the graph more than once. 
And because dust smokes makes graphing very quick, we can remind ourselves. So here's the sign. This horizontal line touches it more than once. Cosine, same thing. Tangent, same thing. Cotangent, same thing. Secant, this horizontal line doesn't, but if we move it up a little, it hits the graph multiple times. Cosecant, likewise. So none of these functions are invertible. But we really want these inverse functions. They don't exist, but without them, we're never going to be able to solve equations like the sine of x equals 0 0.7. So it's a dilemma. And the solution that people came up with was to restrict the trig functions to certain intervals and to take the inverses on those intervals. So when you first see this, which is hopefully not calculus one, I mean, you were supposed to have some kind of trig before this class, when you first see this, it's certainly not the most intuitive thing. But if you look at the sign, for example, okay, this function is not invertible because this horizontal line keeps hitting it multiple times. If you looked at the sign, let me make sure I get this right. If you looked at the sign on the interval from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, well, this new function is invertible. You see this line that was hitting it multiple places and stopping the inverse from existing is now only hitting it once. And, and all horizontal lines. I mean, we can probably see from this graph, any horizontal line we draw is going to hit this curve in at most one place. So we do that. Let me see. New share back to the white. We do that, we take the sign, we put a restriction on it, I guess we don't really need those brackets, we put a restriction on it that makes this function be invertible and we define the in. First. 
and there are two competing pieces of notation for the inverse of this restricted sign. There's that, and there's this. And it's probably pretty old-fashioned. I suspect that most modern textbooks are using this notation, but I guess I guess the advantage of being the professor is that you can be old-fashioned if you want to. Um, I use that notation for the inverse, the arc sign. And I don't, well, I was going to say I don't care which notation you use. On the quizzes, you won't really be using notation. On the test, I mean, the test will be given in paper. I mean, it will be take home, but you'll be doing work for me. And on the test, I don't care which notation you use. But for me, it's the arc sign. So what does this mean? in terms of this problem. We can, because we have the, uh, we have the inverse now, but only sort of. The inverse isn't really the inverse of the sign, it's the inverse of this weird kind of restricted sign. Well, what happens is you can take the arc sign of the sine of x and on the left, the arc sine of the sine will be x. And we have found x. Or at least from what I've written on the board, it seems we've found x. Let's see, I probably forgot to load this calculator up, so give it like 30 seconds to a minute. So your calculator uses of the notation that I showed you. Uh, let me first of all share this. Your calculator uses this notation, the, the function with the negative one up here. So these inverse trig functions are above the trig functions. You get to them by pressing the second button and then the trig function. And let me see. 0.7, I think it was, and we get an answer, 0 0.775. Uh, the catch, and this is really a a trigonometry thing. It's not going to show up really in calculus, but let's be thorough. The catch is that the sine of x equals 0 0.7 has infinitely many solutions 
using the arc sign gives us one solution. In particular, using the arc sign gives us a solution in this restriction. So if we go back to Desmos, here is um, the sine of x, here is 0.7. Now we zoom out, Desmos is fighting me a little. Here's the solution that we just found, but there are infinitely more. And going from, I mean, taking a solution that you found and using that solution to find other solutions, as I say, that's like a trigonometry problem. That's not something that's really going to be relevant in this course. In fact, truth be told, a lot of what we just said isn't going to be super relevant in this course, but it would be a shame to start doing calculus with the inverse trig functions if you've completely forgotten what the inverse trig functions are. So some amount of review seemed appropriate. And actually, let's see, it's a little early, but this is a super good place to break up the lecture. We introduce the inverse trig functions Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We do calculus with them. So let's do that. And I will see you tomorrow. Huh? Less bright and early at 9 a.m.